Good afternoon. I now call to order the meeting of the Curriculum Committee for Thursday, March 18th, 2021. Baltimore County Public Schools and offices continue to be closed to the public and non-essential personnel in order to maintain the health and safety of our students and staff. In accordance with the Board of Education's amended resolution approved at the October 13th, 2020 board meeting in the event of a medical or health emergency related to COVID-19, the board chair in consultation with the vice chair and the superintendent may declare that a board meeting or a board committee meeting be held remotely in its entirety without the physical presence of board members or in a hybrid manner with only some individual board members participating remotely subject to the establishment of a mechanism that would allow each board member the opportunity to fully participate in the meeting despite not being physically present and that would allow the public to also remotely attend those portions of the meeting that are open pursuant to the Maryland Open Meetings Act by being able to listen and or view those portions of the meeting. As a result, today's curriculum committee meeting is being held virtually and broadcasted through live stream on the BCPS website. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Ms. Cox, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. The committee members, um, Ms. Pastor. Present. Mr. Offerman. Present. Dr. Hager. Present. Ms. Mack? Present. Mr. Mahomza? Present. Thank you. Ms. Cox, please call the roll of staff members participating in today's meeting. Um, staff members, Dr. McComas? Present. Ms. Shea? Present. Dr. Parandosi? Present. Dr. Wistad? Present. And we also have presenters. We have Dr. Wheeler. Present. We have Ms. Kraft. Present. And Dr. Wolf. Present. And we also have two guests, Dr. Bennett. Present, thank you. And Dr. Nieves. Present. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cox. I'm going to ask the question, but I believe you've handled it. Are there any other members participating on the call that you have not named? Thank you. A reminder, please, when uh, not speaking, to have your mics off, committee. Um, Discussions will be by calling off uh, names of committee members to speak in turn. And committee members also please acknowledge uh, that you have a question by calling on the chair, then saying your name. Staff members will answer any questions posed by the committee members by saying their name first, then speaking. Thank you and welcome to all of you and thank you for being here today for this uh, really important, all of our meetings are important, but this is one I can say, I think um, the, the committee members will agree uh, that has been asked about not just by committee members, but by our constituents and other board members. And that has to do with reading and particularly 
the three D's. For this afternoon, because uh, we have such heavy lifting happening today, I'm going to ask that between uh, the uh, or during uh, the presentations that we uh, not interrupt for questions unless the presenters stop and ask if there are any questions at a point, just so we can make sure that each presentation uh, gets to the end as planned. Uh, with that being said, um, Dr. McComas, is there anything you'd like to say before we get started? Uh, no, ma'am, other than we appreciate the opportunity and, and I'd like to thank everybody for their patience. I know this year there's been many uh, important topics that um, people have wanted to cover and, and this was one that um, we're happy to finally be able to schedule and bring forward. So with that, I think we should jump in as soon as we can. So thank you, Ms. Pasteur and, and members you, of the Dr. committee. Dr. McComas. So I'm now going to turn the first presentation on the three Ds over to Dr. Perendozzi. Ms. Shea and Dr. Wheeler, and thank you again. Good afternoon. Mr. Corns, will you be sharing the screen? Thank you so much. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, board members, and viewing BCPS families, team members, and community partners. I am Dr. Catherine Perandozzi, Executive Director of special education and we'll introduce the team that will be presenting. Ms. Shea. Good afternoon, everyone. I traded with my daughter, so I actually have a camera today. <laughs> and Dr. Wheeler. Good afternoon. Wonderful to see everyone. Before I go ahead with the um, beginning the presentation, I would like to let everyone know that this work is brought today as a collaborative effort, and that is led not only by our loyal and trusted leader, Curriculum of, in of Curriculum and Instruction, and that is Dr. Boswell McComas. We have a wonderful partnership that continues with the Department of Social Emotional Support that's led by Dr. Nieves and his team from the Office of Psychological Services, and that is led by Dr. Elisa Bennett. So we do thank you for participating in this, and now we'll move through our presentation. Next slide, please. So our objectives, our objectives here today is really to work through not only providing everyone with a deeper understanding, it's really twofold, talking about and providing a deeper understanding and taking a look into the three Ds and the associated instructional implications here, as well as examining what we and BCPS are providing the supports to students and staff as we meet the needs of students in one or more of these identified learning needs. Next slide. Thank you. The definitions provided here have been taken from uh, an MSDE um, technical assistance bulletin that was developed back in 2016. We wanted to remain using this state language and guidance when we work in meeting the needs of our students. This way we build capacity not only amongst our staff, but provide that up with our teachers that are providing the support directly to students. We maintain that same language across all of BCPS, and we talk about supporting them in that environment and with this same language. We begin with the three definitions and that very first line, if you look at that line at the very top, it speaks to the same definition for all three. It's a neurologically based specific learning disability. And why did I separate that line out when posting all three definitions? And I know this slide has a lot on it, and that's not typically what we do on slides and presentations. It's really there for a reference for you and to keep that there for you, because we're going to speak specifically about each one of these areas. But I pulled that line out for a reason, and I'm going to say this is important to note. You will hear me say this is important to note a lot, um, especially when I speak to things that are learning needs regarding children. One, of course, my special education background, and when we talk about students that have specific or unique needs, everything to me is important to note. But in this case, I say that because there's these three words, right? That specific learning disability. And I draw your attention to that because yes, all of them come from a neurobiological origin, 
but those three words usually typically have most of us conduct this word association to specific learning learning disability as an eligibility for special education. And I want you to know that I want you to caution here that this is not necessarily or does not equate. The three D's do not equate directly to special education. So I want you to think about that now um, and as we talk through this and speak about learning needs and know that although those words and even the state MSDE, our Department of Education, has that in these definitions, it doesn't necessarily equate directly to special education, an IEP, or an eligibility of specific learning disabilities. We'll talk a little bit more about that later towards uh, the end, wrapping up this presentation, so we'll go ahead through that. We also want you to know that out of these three definitions, when we talk about the needs and we define some of these needs, that remember the services, supports, and accommodations that are provided for students to support these area of needs or these difficulties that students experience based on their needs can be provided comprehensively and collaboratively within their general education setting for all students. So let's talk first about dyslexia, right? Dyslexia is characterized with difficulties for students, some of them that are very familiar with us. Word recognition in reading, spelling, um, decoding in phonological areas, of components of language. We have secondary areas that they come up that are reading comprehension. So we know those to be very common. We've been working on that for years and historically, I understand that it's been um, coming through back from 2016 was a major step in Maryland. So I think that that's something that has been worked through in our environment, and I know that Ms. Shea is going to cover a lot of what's been established, uh, well established at BCPS. Dyscalculia, we're working on students that have difficulties in problem solving, right? Arithmetic problem solving, math concepts. It's not every single student that has difficulty in math or math areas, but they are established, well established difficulties. And we're going to identify what some of those are, and you're going to see there's a variety of difficulties that could be. And remember, a lot of difficulties or learning disabilities are persistent and consistent over time. Dysgraphia can present itself in two ways, language based and non-language based, and we kind of say what are some of those things, and we'll talk about what that looks like. Spelling, poor handwriting, trouble putting thoughts on paper. I've highlighted those in red so that we can connect the longer definition with some shorter brief concepts that help us to understand. Next slide, please. This slide, and you'll see some captive slides throughout that break us into these topic areas. I think a visual, Again, my background, visuals always make it come to life for me. Um, the visuals here provide us not only with what it can look like for us, but what can it look like for a student? How does a student understand what does dyslexia mean to me? Um, what does that look like and how do I understand what my learning needs are as a student with dyslexia? So if you notice that first set of circles that are around dyslexia in and of itself talks about the varying areas that they can have that difficulty, right? It can be in reading, it can be in writing, it can be in listening. And then if you look at the extending difficulties in each of those areas, they all relate. So if you look at memory, for example, when we talk about sequencing and how it relates to numbers and alphabet, well then think about how that can extend itself into sequencing and spelling and then listening and how that the numbers and alphabet can relate into writing. So when we talk about dyslexia, think about how learning difficulties can be layered and compound for a student with dyslexia relating not only to reading, but to writing for them, then mapping and then how that can layer itself over into something more comprehensive. Remember when I said in the dyslexia definition how it came into secondary, which then lends itself into reading comprehension. So a student with dyslexia it can be very, it can com be comprehensive 
in its learning difficulties as it layers. And it, that is a spectrum of learning difficulty for someone. Next slide. What we're going to talk about over the next three slides actually are all of the instructional supports and accommodations that can be awarded to a student that has learning needs. This starts from the very from can go from preschool all the way through students that attend school through the 21st birthday, right? And that's a student that is in a general education setting in a specialized receiving specially designed instruction or those that are receiving instruction through an um, ESOL supports. These are strategies and interventions that can be that teachers can provide during their planning, during instruction as they prepare materials, as they develop them in the routines and procedures, during testing, during independent activities or classroom group activities. So all of the instructional supports can be provided. The point here is that it can be provided throughout the day and throughout their independent or instructional activities. I'm just going to give you some examples and speak to how that works because these provided lists are not always exhaustive. Um, a teacher can be very creative and comprehensive in a list depending on what the need, what student needs are. They're not a grocery list. Not every one of these is for every single student because student needs varies. As if you remember in that slide that shows that the picture of all the varying needs, not every student with dyslexia has every one of those difficulties. Do they check that box, right? It could be one or more. So if you talk about a visual schedule or reading out loud, sometimes color strips, large prints, some of these things in addition to extra time, repeated readings, repeated um, opportunities with similar or same text helps to build fluency, helps to learn and see and identify not only fluency, but seeing the pattern, the pattern of words. A lot of these examples allow students to not only identify, commit to memory, practice. So for these types of strategies or learning tools or interventions that students can then take back and practice themselves, use them or fill them. I call them sometimes their bag of tricks that they can apply to study skills when practicing vocabulary words or building their own study skills for strategies um, in another subject area, not just in reading in science or social studies or any other subject area that they may need to build a vocabulary bank for, they can utilize these same strategies and working with their peers in a small group um, activity. They can also be applied even if a student is working in math on word problems. So some of these not only in materials, we talk about them in materials and routines, but they can be applied across the board. I want you to keep in mind some of these and the examples that are used because you're going to see how some of them can be used not only in dyslexia, but for dysgraphia and dyscalculia as well. Next slide. Instructional supports apply also in the areas of the actual teacher instruction, right? Instruction that applies in that day-to-day -day concept and it can be in any classroom experience. The classroom experience, no matter what type of instruction, whether it is individual or it is whole group, small group, if we are providing students in independent or um, um, small group instruction, we can provide them with simple directions, we can provide them with oral directions, and even if we're giving out a worksheet, highlighting them, breaking down the worksheet into small group, small sections so that they understand that they do not have to do it in one comprehensive page, providing a rubric so that it identifies an organized approach to this. Everything we do for students that have dyslexia that minimize, that may minimize and not overwhelm a student will assist them in not only the learning process, but 
help them in their um, executive functioning skills. It will also take away distractors. Again, allowing them step by step and not to be overwhelmed. Also, we can repeat directions for them. We can introduce an activity with a one step direction, two step directions. This sounds like a lot to folks, and sometimes people, educators, as well as non-educators will say, that seems like a lot of planning. You're asking a lot of teachers in order to do this for students. I have 25 children in my class. How can I individualize that for that student? Let me say you are planning. You are planning for 25 students. Those directions that you are providing, you're providing them for 25. Just take those 25 and break them apart. Photocopy that page of 25 and just photocopy it in sections. There are ways to make this easier and to address all students. Because whether or not a student has been identified with dyslexia or you see them struggling, if we even ask the student or just walk up to the student with the directions on their desk and cover half of that paper with a blank piece of paper, you are supporting that student and their learning and taking away a distractor and could make a world of difference in allowing that student a learning opportunity and possibly increasing their, their um, their opportunity to learn and grade and performance and taking away anxiety. And you will also build self-esteem with that child at that moment with just one simple intervention or strategy. Next slide. So the next is um, when we introduce new concepts, building new concepts and um, tests and assignments you can see, as you can see, here's three slides that speak about covering, especially for students with dyslexia, all of the avenues in which we can apply interventions and strategies supporting our students. There are many ways in which educators can plan and our instructional support and other adult support systems can provide assistance to students in every single one of our classrooms. We can do so together collaboratively. They can also do so when we are pulling students out and, and supporting them in small groups. Pre-teaching vocabulary words. We can provide them a list of vocabulary words in advance. We can provide them outlines of lessons that are forthcoming. We can provide advanced organizers. Things, there are many books on tape that are available to students. We can provide them audio visuals. We can allow students to create visuals on their own and acknowledging what they already know about a topic. And there are many learning strategies that we have done in advance that apply to all students. We know some of these strategies from years of working with what we thought were strategies to work for students with learning disabilities that now apply to all students. Um, testing and grading. Um, it's not so much grading differently, but identifying that we're grading for content knowledge and not just spelling in this situation, unless it's related specifically to spelling. Are we grading for the content knowledge of, is it regarding um, a, the, a topic in science specifically about science content, or are we grading on the spelling, right? So let's talk about what some of that looks like and our purpose for content. And then we, we allow students to provide us various methods and responses. We can provide sentence starters. Um, we can provide, again, extended time. And do we allow them to be removed from a setting, quiet room in which to respond, or a quiet room in which to finish a task that maybe they can no longer do in their traditional classroom setting. So we have options for students and we want to allow them to do that. And those options or accommodations are allowable accommodations that we continue to do. And we are allowing them to do that right now in their general education setting. None of these, none of these instructional supports that we've reviewed in these last three slides require an IEP or a specialized learning plan or a 504 plan, these students, these are allowable instructional supports and accommodations for all of our students. I'm now gonna pass it over to Ms. Shea. 
Thank you, Dr. Pirandozzi. Um, next slide. And for those of you in the BCPS community who are just meeting Dr. Pirandozzi for the first time, I just listen. I could listen to you all day, Dr. Pirandozzi. We're so lucky to have you in BCPS. Um, so members of the committee are probably very familiar with this um, frame. This visual represents our multi-tiered system of supports, and I know that our ELA director, Ms. Kraft, um, and Dr. Wolf are here today, and we're going to be talking more about um, part of this tier in our next presentation. Um, but this is really an opportunity for me to recapture some of what Dr. Pirandozzi just shared um, regarding how these strategies and how these approaches, is, and even a diagnosis of having a student with dyslexia, um, is not an automatic response in one tier or another. Um, but what I'm also want to talk about is how developing this reading multi-tiered system of supports that you see outlined here um, with specific program applications was really done in a very deliberate and intentional partnership between the offices of English language arts and the office of special education. And that is because of what Dr. Pirandozzi just described. We know that we have students with dyslexia who are not captured as students receiving special education services. And so as part of our general education approach to developing curriculum and identifying appropriate instructional resources, it's important that we build that understanding for our practitioners in the classroom of what learning to read looks like and also have an awareness about how to use diagnostic and screening tools tools to develop that awareness and prevent reading failure. So much of what we have learned from our community members in the last several years, as Dr. Perandozzi talked a little bit about the history, is that too often some of our students and families faced multiple years where those needs were not being met because of a lack of awareness of that reading development and the need for that systematic and explicit multi-sensory instruction referenced by Dr. Perandozzi in the previous slides. So part of those efforts and part of the beginning efforts for addressing any of the needs that we're talking about today really must begin with a strengthening of that tier one. We have to ensure that all of our students as a universal have access to a very strong and explicit and high quality curriculum at that tier one level so that we're providing the universal access to high quality instruction. That way, when we use those diagnostic tools, we can supplement that instruction to ensure we're providing that targeted and intensive support where needed. So members of this committee will know that part of our efforts in the last couple of years and with your support, we have been able to identify that very strong evidence based core tier one program in our primary grades for teaching foundational reading skills using open court. This is fairly new. It's only been in place in the last um, few years, but we are committed to ensuring that we have that systematic and explicit instruction in phonemic awareness, in phonics, in fluency, so that all of our students have access to a high quality evidence-based curriculum. And when we talk about things like systematic and explicit as two words we use to describe our curriculum, what we're referencing is the scientific basis for the sequence in which we introduce sounds and letter combinations to help spell those sounds in a way that reflects our best knowledge of brain research and how the brain acquires reading. When we're born, we're hardwired for sound and spoken language, but reading and understanding the alphabetic principle, uh, word roots, morphemes and phonemes, all requires explicit and systematic instruction. And so to that end, you'll also see reflected on the slide, and I'm going to talk more about it in a few moments, that in that tier one, we also have been very deliberate and intentional in our partnership to ensure we're providing professional development. And so the letters professional development, which I'll talk more about in a few moments, has really been our effort in the last five years to ensure that all of our primary teachers, and we're now expanding into intermediate, even in middle and high school, but that all of our teachers who are working with students on these important skills have a very clear and explicit understanding of how the brain learns to read and how those letter speech sounds are represented with the English spelling combinations. That will allow teachers to not only provide that high quality first instruction, but also to be able to be aware and respond when students demonstrate those first signs of striving to acquire reading. 
once tier one um, instruction is fully in place and reflected in a lot of our efforts as a system to really strengthen that from a curriculum perspective, then through those diagnostics, we're able to identify students that would need supplemental instruction in tier two. Again, as Dr. Pirandozzi described, students with dyslexia may have their needs met directly in tier one with that solid core instruction or may potentially need supplemental instruction in tier two. Open Court includes supplemental instruction, which you'll actually hear a little bit more about in our next presentation when we talk about the Ready to Read Act. But we also have other resources that have been identified that can target some of these same needs in phonemic awareness and phonics as evidenced potentially with a student identified as being dyslexic. And so those programs include SIPs as well as um, resources, Hegarty phonemic awareness that we use in our primary grades. Still, as Dr. Pirandozzi described, students identified as having dyslexia are not a monolith. They represent a lot of different needs. And so we do also have, as part of our multi-tiered system of supports, tier three interventions and training. And so you may be most familiar with Orton Gillingham. Orton Gillingham is a very strong approach that is multisensory in nature and builds upon and addresses this neurodiversity that we often see in students diagnosed as having dyslexia. The training that we are able to offer in Norton Gillingham has also been the result of that partnership between the offices of ELA and the Department of Special Education. We know that this is a very specialized approach and the Orton Gillingham strategies are really important for helping to build that very clear, systematic and multi-sensory approach to teaching phonemic awareness and phonics. In addition to the professional learning, which again, I'll talk about more in a moment, there are resources. And so we do have staff that have this training in our buildings to be able to provide that tier three support when needed. And so we also in our primary grades have another tier three resource titled foundations. Everything you see here reflected on the screen represents multiple years of work. And that work was again done in collaboration so that we can ensure that we are really living out the principles described by Dr. Pirandozzi. We want our students who have a variety of ways that they acquire reading to have a menu of supports that we're able to provide and the professional learning for our educators to go along with it. Down on the left hand side, you'll see us reference Dibbles, our screener, and there's more on that in the next presentation, so I won't get too far into that, but that is a universal screener that we use um, as part of that Ready to Read Act, which you'll hear more about in our next presentation. Next slide. I'm also really proud. I've mentioned a few times now the professional learning. This is a critical part of developing that awareness. When Dr. Pirandozzi talked about our objectives for the presentation today, we also want to acknowledge that those objectives have been guiding our work as a system for many years. And so I mentioned already that we begin by offering that universal training for all classroom teachers, general education teachers, special education teachers, including administrators. The acronym LETTERS stands for Language Essentials for Teachers of Reading and Spelling. These are uh, modules for professional learning that have been developed by Dr. Louisa Motes and some of her additional colleagues, including Dr. Carol Tolman, a, a personal friend to BCPS. In BCPS, we have been for several years now offering cohorts of modules one, two, and three. This is critical because these modules address the concepts identified by the International Dyslexia Association as being critical knowledge for teachers of students with dyslexia. And really, we believe they're critical for teaching all of our students beginning as readers. It's also important um, based on legislation of late to note that it meets ESSA um, or the Every Student Succeeds Act evidence criteria. So the language essentials training or letters training has been ongoing. And I'm also pleased to note that in our shift in the last year, based on the emergency closures to the pandemic, we have been able to pivot with our training and continue to provide that training in a virtual setting. The second opportunity for professional learning that I already mentioned is now for a specialized type of training. And this is our Orton Gillingham training. This training has been incredibly well received by our community of teachers and support professionals serving our students because it is allowing them to learn more specifically the strategies and approaches that are useful for supporting students identified as dyslexic. 
again, we know that these research based strategies can be appropriate and applied to lots of students, but what we want to make sure is that we're differentiating those strategies and professional learning that are appropriate for all teachers and then supplementing that with that deep dive training in Orton Gillingham for students who are supporting uh, for teachers, excuse me, who are supporting our students identified as having dyslexia. And so I share all this by way of saying again, this has been a multi year commitment. Uh, we certainly are continue to be committed to this work and to ensuring that all of our teachers um, have access to high quality professional learning and high quality curriculum resources to strengthen that tier one first, but then to also make sure that we're poised to offer that menu of a multi tiered system of supports. And so. Everything I've shared around dyslexia really then can be a model for how we're approaching these next two topics. So I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Bjorn Tuzzi as we shift to the next slide um, to turn our attention to dysgraphia. Dr. Bjorn uh, Tuzzi. Dr. Parandozzi, before you go into dysgraphia, because I, I, I don't want us to get so far down the road that people won't get a chance to ask um, their questions. So this is what I propose that I go around everyone gets to ask its most encompassing question about dyslexia and then we'll go into dysgraphia and then by the time we get to the end if there are other questions still needed we'll do that so i'm going to if that works for you is that fine dr Ms. Parent, Hester, you're there? modeling chunking of information i think that's a very appropriate strategy giving everything we've just shared <laughs> you know i'm an old school educator i know you are and i appreciate that <laughs> thank you uh so i'm going to start i'll just i'll just call uh, folks, and if you want to pass, you may pass. So I'm going to start with Dr. Hager, your most encompassing question right now about dyslexia. OK, I've got a few, but my most my most encompassing one um, has to do with the number of teachers um, that have received the professional learning that you mentioned, and I apologize if I missed it. But at this point, what proportion of teachers in the elementary, middle and high school level have received this additional training to work with kids with dyslexia? It's a great question, Dr. Hager. Unfortunately, I just clicked out of my OneDrive. I'm going to pull it up and before we close today, I don't even have to follow up. I'll get you that number um, and I want to make sure it's the most current, but I think at last count it was close to 1300, but I'll double check my numbers before we finish this afternoon and reopen my document. Yeah, Ms. and if you did let me know. Also, I'm sorry, Dr. Hager. I just also want Ms. Shea to expand a little bit. I know time is of the essence for us, but our process of how we're it, it's like a rolling piece that we're constantly working on that. Yes, so thank you for that. We um, we open it um, basically in cohorts. So I mentioned that there are three different modules for the letters. So let me take the letters first, which is the one that we offer to all teachers. Um, we begin with the three different modules and we offer those modules as three separate days and we do ask that the cohorts commit to attending all three. So when we have a cohort, um, we open it and we the first year we did it, we opened it that um, schools could send up to four teachers from each um, school and that was our hope that we potentially could get maybe a K-1-2 teacher, K-1-2-3. Um, also referencing, of course, we're always balancing that with um, schools having Having substitutes. You know, we never want to pull our teachers away from our kids, but yet we're trying to invest in professional learning. Um, and we've been doing that for multiple years. So that's why I was saying um, for the last three to four years, we've done roughly 400 teachers each year as we do those cohorts. If you think about, I'm, I'm giving you the ballpark numbers as I pull it up. Um, and so what that's enabled us to do is to have these cohorts running uh, pretty consistently throughout the year. So once we finish a cohort and have gotten them through module one, two, and three, then we will open the next co uh, cohort. And we're usually able to do um, approximately three cohorts a year because we typically can do them in fall, spring. And then we have been able to do sometimes more than one in the summer, depending on funding. And that's a little bit more popular um, because of course then teachers are um, not being pulled from the classroom to do that. So um, that's our approach to how we've done that. We have um, 
we don't see us stopping anytime soon because we do, of course, also have teacher turnover. So even though there may be one year that uh, schools have been able to go through and, and share their training, uh, we know that by the next summer they're likely to have another new teacher. So I also want to invite, I know I'm fortunate today that Dr. Wolf is here with us, so she also might have more current numbers because as the coordinator of elementary language arts, she's been really instrumental um, in helping us. So Dr. Wolf, if you have anything you want to contribute, um, please feel free to to chime in um, to help address that. Um, as I mentioned, we have also been expanding into um, middle and high school, and so we've been able to um, offer letters for our teachers who teach reading intervention as well. Um, and then we also have in some instances done, uh, we've had some of our school based administrators use some of their Title I funds to do this training for like their entire staff. So they have in some cases utilized additional funds to bring in like their entire staff on subsequent or consecutive Saturdays, for example, um, because they really wanted the entire staff to have it. So that's sort of our design in general and, and can give you kind of a ballpark. Again, Dr. Wolf, if you have better numbers than I do, and if not, I will um, keep looking um, while we continue talking. But I hope that helps kind of describe our approach for how we've been doing that. Thank you. Again, we and, and I want to make it really clear, especially for the viewing public, we have no intention of stopping this. This training is um, really, really critical. We know we'll continue to have teacher turnover and there are many more modules. To be honest with you, letters is a phenomenal opportunity. I myself have, um, have gone through the letters training, so I've been through all the modules multiple times. It is uh, phenomenal and uh, we hope that as we continue, we can even be able to offer more modules. So I want to be really clear that while I'm proud of the numbers we've done to date, we have no intention of taking that foot off the gas with that. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Hager, for your question. And um, Ms. Shea, thank you for that answer. Um, still with your most encompassing question, um, Mr. Offerman. Uh, this question actually relates to all three of the topics that are going to be discussed. And that is, is there any relationship uh, of these things with students who have speech issues or speech difficulty. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Offerman. Anyone want to answer that now? Shall we wait until we've moved a little further? Since he's right, it does touch on other things. So this is Ms. Shea, and I'm certainly going to defer to Dr. Pirandozzi um, and anyone from that team. But what I will say is there is some overlap with, um, I can speak to um, in the content we focus on with the letters training I described, um, there is a lot of overlap in terms of the forming of the speech sounds in English. And so um, when we approach it from a reading standpoint, we want students to be able to recognize and um, distinguish or discern the different sounds. Our speech pathologists help then when students have difficulty either distinguishing those sounds or in many cases producing those sounds. So they also supplement that by helping to explicitly teach students mouth formation, paying attention to where your tongue and your lips and your teeth are when you form the letters. So there's definitely a lot of instructional overlap. Um, between how we approach some of the speech sounds of English like I described in the professional learning. So we do engage teachers in paying attention, using mirrors to note what are my lips doing, what are my teeth doing, uh, feeling our vocal cords to feel voiced and voiceless consonants of when we engage those vocal cords. And all of that would overlap with some of the explicit instruction that might be necessary um, or done by a speech pathologist. So I know as I've worked with teams of teachers and in my own experience, um, that's often a really powerful collaboration between the speech pathologists and the teachers. As to whether or not they co-articulate as if there is a similarity in identification, that I cannot speak to. So I would have to defer to Dr. Pirandozzi about that. So hi, good afternoon. And so I, I would say that that would be an evaluative process in which I do not evaluate and um, for the speech and language. So I can't answer that specifically. I'm sorry. And I've never evaluated on speech and language. I've only done some of the academic evaluative, uh, use the eva evaluative tools. So I would not want to speak outside of my area um, and not in that lane of their expertise. Um, that's a clinical expertise that I do not have or possess. 
But however, um, I think Ms. Shea kind of explained that specifically. It, it does relate in that sound and symbol relationship and where it would help to improve the instructional process. You will see that a lot of that speech to text and some of those other areas can help to improve. They are some of the strategies that are used in interventions that are used across for each of them because of the language and non-language in um, dyscalculia and in dysgraphia, you can utilize some of those. So we want to continue to allow that and, and all of the providers that can provide some supports and interventions. But as far as relating specifically to um, the cross of identification, I do not know that. I would have to ask a speech clinician specifically. Thank and you. Dr. Dr. Wheeler, unless, sir, you are aware of any evaluative tool that may, um, and I don't know if that's in your wheelhouse, sir. I'll just add, I mean, we talk about these things as always being language-based learning disabilities, right? Dysgraphia and dyslexia. So there certainly is a foundation there. Um, a lot of times we are looking at, you know, the being able, the ability to perceive language, you know, to be able to then, you know, repeat it and parrot it. Um, and we'll get into we will touch on this a bit more as we get into the actual specific learning disability piece, but there are components in there for listening comprehension, oral expression. Those are specific types of specific learning disability where we do see much more language impact. Thank you. And I'm looking at the time, but Ms. Mack and then Mr. Mahomes are with your most encompassing. And I will skip my questions because some of them have been touched on. Ms. Mack. Um, thanks, um, Ms. Pestier. Um, my question is this, since I've been on the board, I have learned a lot about Orton Gillingham, um, but I was surprised to see foundations as a tier three um, intervention some, because I had never heard of it. So I spent some time this afternoon looking at it and it's my understanding that basically foundations is a tier one support. If there are children who need just a little bit extra, I think um, the information I looked at said they can give them a double dose as a tier two but that it is not intended to be a tier three support. So I'm wondering if what I've read is correct. And if it is, how did we get to foundations as a tier three support and what specifically are we using? Thank you, Ms. Mack. I want to respond to Ms. Mack. So hi, Ms. Mack, this is Ms. Shea. And then again, I will, um, defer to my colleagues to chime in. So I'm not sure, I'm assuming what you were just reading is from maybe the foundation's website? From the Wilson's language um, dot com programs mm -hmm. um, forward slash foundations. Yeah, <laughs> thank you for the forward slash part. Um, so part of what I want to just offer is foundations is how when, when when we talk about tiered interventions, there's a couple of different things to um, remember. Some of the tiering of in interventions is about how it's used as a supplement or replacement. So in BCPS and some of our primary grades, Foundations has, based on the Wilson approach, a much more multi-sensory approach than what might have um, previously been in place before we had open court. So some of what you see reflected in the tiering is actually historical in that, remember that it's pretty new that we had this solid open court tier one um, approach. So some of the way that we've identified the programs we're using for tiering, um, some of what makes it a tier three is the way that it's delivered rather than just inherent in the material itself. So what I shared with you is the way that we utilize the foundation's resources, meaning that if a student is in foundations, it is a replacement for open court. It is not used. If we're going to do the double dose or supplement that you described, we would be continuing to use open court resources for that. Um, and so some of what I was describing is, um, again, that historical context of how those resources are utilized in BCPS. You're muted, Ms. Mack, so I can't. <laughs> I said I have many follow-up questions, but in the interest of time, I will submit them in writing. Sure, that Bye. sounds great. Ms. Mack and Ms. Shea, Mr. Mahomza, and before Mr. Mahomza starts, let me say when he's asked his question, 
and an answer has been given, then we will go to dysgraphia and dyscalculia. And I'm going to ask for those two that you just go ahead and combine them. And then we will ask questions then based on time because I do want to get to the last presentation. So, Mr. Mahomza. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, similar to uh, Mr. Offerman's question, I think mine can also be intertwined with the other um, areas uh, of the 3Ds. But my question is, um, in the in training uh, our ESOS teachers, uh, is there is their training uh, different or more advanced um, uh, for those teaching uh, students who are English uh, English language learners? Uh, and if so, can you talk? I know that you mentioned the international um, um, model. Uh, can you talk about that? So, Mr. Mahamza, I want to make sure I understand your question. Are you asking specifically about how we teach phonics to English learners? Um, yeah, specific. And it, it, I know, like, uh, although the language gap, I know that students who are English learn language learners are still um, learning English, but I'm, those who have uh, dyslexia but also have um, also are trying to learn English. Uh, do we have a way of identifying those students? And if so, would that training for those teachers be different? Oh, OK, so I think I understand your question better. So there's a couple of things in play with what you're talking about. So you're right. We don't want to um, the language acquisition is different when you're in learning English, obviously, as a second language versus when you're reflecting that neurodiversity that Dr. Pirandozzi was describing. However, some of the strategies in terms of being multisensory in our approach and, and all the different ways that we instructionally approach it could be the same. Um, the other part of your question about is, is a really good one because we often use the term English language learner as if that in itself is a monolith and we're talking about just as much variability within that student population as we have within any other population. And so it is a challenge to identify when working with English learners um, what their literacy ability might be in what we call their L1 or their first primary language. So the difference between teaching a student who maybe comes to us as a first grader who's an English learner is trying to acquire English who maybe already was demonstrating um, that type of neurodiversity in their development of their um, first literacy would require a different approach. Um, we're getting better at it in terms of trying to collaborate around some of those diagnostic tools. So the one that I mentioned, Dibbles, there are different ways that we can use linguistic supports to utilize some of those diagnostics, but it's definitely an area that we need to continue to uh, work collaboratively between ELA and special education and ESOL um, to try to support that because just like um, as Dr. Pirandozzi described, there's so many different variations of how we support students with dyslexia. That is another layer. And so part of what we have to do um, in general with special education and English learner identification is really to understand how much of it is based on that linguistic diversity and that acquisition of language and how much of it really resides within um, the actual um, acquisition of language. So once we um, sort of uh, get to that point where we're able to have really reliable diagnostic information, I think the training would likely be twofold. So we do have some of our ESOL teachers that will participate in the letters training, and I believe some may, I'd have to check, but I believe we've even had some crossover where some of them uh, participate in um, training for it in Gillingham. And likewise, we've had our reading specialists have training from the Office of ESOL. Um, so we are sort of sensitive to what I would describe as kind of that Venn diagram that you described in terms of that training for teachers. I hope that helps to answer your question, if I understood it correctly. Thank you, Mr. Mahomza and Ms. Shea. As we move on, I'm going to give my question, but I don't want an answer now. My question is, goes to parents. How do we uh, inform parents of this wealth of information? How do we offer them support in terms of services? Because this can be very overwhelming and misunderstood. A lot of myths and being able to separate myths from facts. So if I don't hear it today, I, I would love to get it 
in um, an update. So now um, let's go to dysgraphia and thank you folks. Thank you, Ms. Pastor. I'm gonna go through, we have the two areas, they are kind of together and we will move through those a little quicker for you. Um, dysgraphia, you see it's the same graphic that kind of shows, gives you that visual again, not only the areas of difficulty, um, classroom management, organization, concentration, and poor fine motor skills, which I think is very obviously the most important for that student. Um, you'll see those areas, you'll see some strategies that can be worked on. I just like to give those visuals that reference it. It can take you back. Um, and give some of the strategies as a um, quick reference sheet. I like providing these for teachers. It's that um, memory of where and how and a, a tool that they could use to always run back to, right? If they cannot remember everything that we've talked about in a training, there's a quick reference sheet that they can always go back to to support children. Um, so that is that that sheet that will always bring us to that that side of the brain where I want you to take a look. Also, if you remember back to the previous one for dyslexia, there are some very similar signs, extra time, um, speech to text, a lot of the things that are verbal in nature that help these students. So I, if, next slide, please. We're gonna talk again, once again, um, same pattern of instruction, those supports and accommodations that are allowable accommodations. Um, on this slide, the next slide, please. On this slide, it talks about the materials, routines, and the instruction. We put those on the same slide. This slide does a lot of the interventions and strategies when a teacher is preparing, and then during the actual instruction time. There are certain pencil grips, things like that, that support that fine motor. Um, uh, needs that a student may have when we speak of dysgraphia, right? That That's something that they can actually utilize on a day-to-day -day basis. That's physical in supporting that student. But what about, you know, those same needs as we go through the instructional time? Well, here we go again with just like dyslexia, that we can provide some of those similar supports additional time to complete the task. We can provide the students with an outline, that hard copy of notes. Instead of allowing them or asking a student to, to take notes, we can provide that hard copy, or we can use that the closed technique where we provide it with the open spaces, allowing them to fill in the critical and most important words so that they are following along. We can provide a grading rubric again so that can help them with the organizational piece, those executive functioning of organizing all of that together. Um, these are assignments and things that they can continually work on. And when we talk about this with dysgraphia, we talk about the language base that may have difficulty in converting sounds to language in the written form. Remember we talked about language base and non-language base. Um, and we talk about alternate spelling and use of sound, that associative learning based piece. So they use that spe alternate spelling for the use of each sound. So we wanna look at that when we talk about supporting students in that area or the non-language base. A student may have a difficulty in performing what is controlled for that fine motor skills that are required, that visual and motor integration. Some students may have difficulty in formulating or organized materials. And I've talked about this a couple of times. We we overlook sometime that executive functioning that's organizing. Think about students, we require them to use lined paper, to set things up, to put their, their names and heading and all of these things that we are titles on paper. And we ask them to do these things. And for most, that's an expectation. And for most students, that may be very easy to follow along. But for some of our students, that can inhibit their learning or their performance. They may know all of the content, but starting off can increase their anxiety that stops them from ever telling you how much they know. So a student that may know the entire content could fail a test because they cannot even get beyond 
setting up the paper the way that it is required. And so we want to take away those barriers, remove the barriers for learning, assess and identify what they know. That is the that is what we are. That is our intent to identify and evaluate learning or or the understanding of the content. We should be evaluating and grading on standards and and eliminating some of those barriers to to learning or identifying the knowledge of standards, right? Next slide, please. And the last for this particular area under testing and assignments, um, we can adapt test forms. We can ask them, reduce the amount of handwriting that's required, circle the answer, fill in the blank. Um, grading, understanding what they know. If we eliminate handwriting in this particular case, we can get more from them. We can assess them differently. We can assess them orally. Remember that prior to with dyslexia, we talked about the different formats of response, um, alternate formats and response. We could do that as well for students with dysgraphia. Students can choose whether to print or cursive. There was a there's a time where or and we do and we have had folks that wanted to do it a certain way. They they can use keyboards. I mean, we can use computers at this point in time in which to respond. We do have assistive technology that students can use in lieu of writing. So um, there are proofreaders. There are many, many software applications that students can use instead of a, um, having them do so in one time, one trial. They could use that in the extended time. Same thing again. Here's another repeat of one of those quiet room opportunities. So I want to show that, and I think these do show that in each of these areas, the same allowable accommodations and instructional supports can apply to support a student that may have one or more of our 3Ds. I'm going to go to the next slide, which will take us to our last, which is dyscalculia. And again, to not just repeat and cover them, I wanted you to see these graphics that that show us these areas of calculation, numbers, measurement, and just a reminder, look at how memory again pops up in each of these. I think the spatial piece here is very important when it, when it has to do with math, but I want you to kind of remember measurement for a quick second. Measurement, um, think about estimation, because I'm going to talk about that um, just a little later actually in the next slide, please. Now something with this particular slide and I with dyscalculia that I think is very important and um, I would like us to talk about uh, for a second, something that people seem to forget in this area. I would like to talk about what it's not. Dyscalculia is not a phenomenon. It's nothing new. It has been around and there has been specialized materials and teaching strategies around math and math learning problems since the 1920s. This is not inconsequential. What I mean by that is math difficulties can erode a student's self-confidence and that leads directly into, it, into adulthood. And I know that every learning difficulty can. We should recognize that but math can impact that day to day. Um, so can reading comprehension. We know that as well, but something like measurement and estimation, it pops up and we, we always tell children, you know, how does it relate to day to day? We have also asked educators relate or use examples during your instruction that relate to their day to day. Give them examples, real life examples. Bring that that instruction to life for them. Bringing it to life for them sometimes can also build anxiety. So and it's OK to to it's not OK. I'm sorry to neglect. And so these authors that I'm going to talk to you that provided these three principles that are noted here want to bring about the emotional rule and that's principle number three and it's about the lifelong consequences in today's world that are both practical and emotional. And so I'll talk about those principles very quickly, but I think that they are important to know and understand, and we want educators to know and understand because it's that last statement in principle number three that I want us to understand for the student's sake 
as well as for us as educators to remember that we take a vital role. But I'll start with principle number one, um, fortifying the math foundation. Fortifying the math foundation means, as we all know, that we've got to get students to have a solid grasp on those concepts, right? We need them to understand the fundamentals before they start taking the leap. We know that math layers and it builds upon each other. So before we start asking them to have written computations, begin to memorize and deal with practicing number facts or words or word problems that begin to develop language, we want them to have a solid grasp and foundation and we can do some of these things through these playful practice, um, creative and mo movable materials. And that was member utilizing some of the um, manipulatives. We want to do things like that. We have to caution and we want to caution educators on remember students. We have students and we have to be careful, be cautious that just because somebody has a speedy verbal um, word association and they can regurgitate facts back to us because they might be able to remember those. It does not mean that that quick response or word association means that they have an understanding of the concepts behind that. So we want to be careful that sometimes that memory does not necessarily mean they have that foundational understanding behind a quick response. Number two, weaving in the concept of language and connections. We want to make sure we're cueing students, not only showing me, but telling me, um, refreshing and solidifying that connection between math concepts and then the language part. It, I just um, kind of talked about how it builds and that language becomes very important. We want to make sure we know that we teach them and we show them. Um, it's using that retrieval practice and we can do that. That's a powerful teaching tool that we want to make sure we reinforce and we can do it individually. We can do it as a group. We can do it as repetitive practice throughout. We can do it as um, introduction practice, meet it in uh, practicing in the middle of classroom or um, at the end as a uh, culminating practice. And then the last one, and this is the one that I find is very important. And when we talk about that social emotional learning and and this is a practice that I think hits home for so many, these authors talk about remember the emotions rule. They say that provoking a strong emotion for those who struggle with math is critical because the complexity of things like word problems can cause frustration and a feelings of defeat. And if we leave those things, unchecked in students that that could exacerbate this feeling of anxiety or feeling of failure and then provide students with this negative script that stays with them. You know, there's something wrong with me or I'm a failure. And that's the part that we never want to leave students with because that's the thing that can carry on for them year after year, especially as math begins to build and those difficulties may begin to build, right? It, they're defeated before they even start sometimes. Um, and then there's this unintended piece that maybe a teacher may add that we want to teach them early on when a when an educator or supports instructional support staff says, well, maybe if you just studied harder or longer or maybe if you practiced more they not knowing that this student has dyscalculia or has not yet been identified so we want to also caution about using those types of words and phrases and try to identify students that may have dyscalculia or dyslexia or dysgraphia and so we want to caution those and that's why emotions can rule. We want to be cautious of that. We want to be aware and we want to teach that and that leads to knowing that being aware of that leads to this professional learning slide. The next slide please. Um, it, I'm sorry, there's one more slide and this is the slide about the instructional supports and then we'll talk about the professional learning. But it's it's very similar. So in in when we talk about dyscalculia, it's it's some of the same instructional strategies and accommodations. You'll see separate worksheets highlighting 
in this case, of course, use of calculators, manip manipulatives, um, breaking down worksheets and activities into smaller sections or chunking, um, use of graph paper, any type of formulas. Remember, we talked about uh, steps, but instead of steps, we can provide visual schedules. Instead of visual schedules, we can provide the list of formulas for them to have um, to work out their math problems and graphic organizers. So all of the previous instructional strategies and interventions that we could use, we could use again in each one of these three Ds. So just think if we teach everyone these strategies, especially some of the same um, solid top 10 strategies, we could use these across the board for all of our children. Next slide, please. So you've heard me mention them over and over, and we talked about the emotions and, and all of the things we need to um, educate everyone, and that's where it gets to the professional learning piece. Now, I believe um, that since arriving here, hearing here, and getting to work collaboratively with um, not only Ms. Shea and my peers, my colleagues within the curriculum and instruction office. And so getting to know and learn what we all do together as a team and seeing that, but getting to see now and learn and work with um, Dr. Nieves's group and their office, I, I, I see what we've done and we now have talked, spoke collectively about what what we need to do, right? What is our future? And so we have our target audience. Our target audience is everyone, right? It's school-based administrators. We wanna to get to the people that are working and supporting children and building that the growth of every one of our students. It's working with our general education teachers. Every student is a general education student first, and so that's where they are educated. And then the, if there's any student that has a need beyond the general education setting, we wanna to get to those folks then. So it's your special education teachers, it's your instructional support providers that may be assisting students outside of a general education classroom, wherever that may be. That's our target audience, it's everyone. It's central office folks, we wanna build capacity there all of the time. Those are, that's our target audience. You know, what's not on that slide is our students. That's our target audience as well, because we want to build their capacity. We want them to be able to know and ask for what their needs are. Um, and and Ms. Pastor, you know, you said it, parents, how do we educate? How, how are we getting to parents? So I wrote share with all on this slide and sharing with all is educating them as well. So if I'm going to do that, that's included in the sharing with all is our community, our families, it's everyone, but I would say I would include them under target audience as well. But professional learning has to happen and it has to happen with awareness. So we've done quite a bit in the area of dyslexia, but as you see in dysgraphia and dyscalculia, we need to, we need to do more, right? And so we need to get out there doing the awareness, the interventions. I think with the three Ds, I think the updates need to continue and we will do that as well. But the social emotional skill building and supports, we will do that collaboratively, collaboratively with all educators and students, because if you saw that in that previous slide in principle number three, we don't wanna make the mistakes and add to anyone's anxiety and inhibit learning. We wanna remove that as a barrier. So I think that one is very, very critical um, to add to the mix, not only educating on the three Ds, not only educating on the instructional supports, but removing that, that one barrier. So I'm gonna pass it over for the last couple of slides to talk about the support services and that tiered support around the three Ds, and that goes to Dr. Wheeler. Uh, Dr. Wheeler, before you start, first of all, um, uh, Dr. Pirandozzi, thank you very much. It is um, quarter to four and several of us are on the next meeting. This is way too critical um, to just stop. This is like just standing in midair. You can't do that. So I'm going to ask, um, uh, very graciously, I hope. Um, first to 
um, Ms. Mack, because I know Ready to Read Act was is something that is important to all of us, but that she asked uh, to be on today's agenda. Um, Ms. Mack, would you be willing to have us look at it for next month's agenda? I would be more than willing. Would you like me to make a motion? No, Ms. Not Dr. necessary. No, it's not necessary. Okay. I yes, I'm more than willing. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Ms. Mack. That being said, let's just take this time so we can embrace these three Ds. So go through your next slides and we possibly will have time for a few more questions. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. McComas and presenters for being understanding. I'm assuming that you're being understanding, but thank you. So continue, Dr. Perendozzi. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Wheeler, would you like to go ahead with the next slide? Thanks, Dr. Wheeler. Thank you, Ms. Mr. Chair. All right, so if we can just get to the next slide, please. Excellent, thank you. So the next part, we'd like to talk a little bit about how we're supporting all of our students through all of these, all the different tiers, right? How are we starting off with general education and then making sure we're, everybody's getting the, the instructional supports that they need. So how this starts out with me is with the data, right? So we'll be looking at doing things like collecting informal assessment data, we'll be using our screening tools, then we'll be doing frequent, ongoing, and consistent progress monitoring. We'll be using all of this data to make decisions, and we're gonna be collecting from multiple sources of information. So what we know is for students with dyslexia, has been talked about a bit already in this presentation, Right, the core needs that we're focusing on here are phonemic awareness, phonics, decoding, and a lot of these timed letter naming tasks. We can use information evaluating these skills early and often, so that way we know where our students are and how intensive a support that they need. The idea is to get our students access to interventions and supports quickly, right? So that way we can meet their needs in these critical windows they have for developing these skills. For dyscalculia, we'd be looking at something like number sense, so like that ability to be able to automatically recognize quantities, right? Can I put three of something down and you just recognize that it's three? Or do you need to think through that and count them out? Um, also with dyscalculia, we're looking at skills like recognizing numbers and symbols, connecting numbers to real life situations and identifying patterns. So again, these are all things that we can do in the general education setting to help us understand that yes, maybe this is a student who has a significant need or a need that's you know greater than what we'd be anticipating for their peers. Uh, these students may struggle with things like being able to recall letters and letter sounds. We'd be looking at things like pencil grip, handwriting posture, and visual spacing. So again, this is just good looking at the exam the curriculum based measures we have work samples and being able to really start to understand and identify these needs early on. Um, school psychologists, you know, as a school psychologist, I'll work with educators frequently uh, to track these responses to intervention, make sure that we are coming up with good logical ways to track progress. Um, you know, you know, a student might need to have it tailored a little bit to what their particular needs are to make sure they're making the progress that they have to be making. And then we can all come together and collaborate to have these um, data-driven decisions to make sure students are getting the correct need, uh, the correct supports for their needs. So if we could go to the next slide, please. So we want to try out students. We want them to have access to these, you know, rigorous tier one and tier two interventions that we've spoken quite a bit about in this presentation. So if they have those, if they've received those interventions and they still are not responding and they're showing that they've kind of exhausted all of that and they need that higher level of support, then we would move to tier three. And that's when we're looking at evaluating for something like a specific learning disability. So dyslexia, dysgraphia, and dyscalcul dys dyscalculia are examples of specific learning disabilities, but they're not synonymous, right? So eligibility is determined through a multidisciplinary evaluation. So for this, we're reviewing previous data, educational history, classroom performance. Often these are involving educational and psychological assessments, classroom observations, as well as all of that data that we collected through tiers one and two. I've seen it function the best when we're getting to tier three, that it's almost like it's a no brainer, right? At this point, we've collected all of this data. We know almost precisely what the student needs. And then it's almost a formality as we're getting to that point. Now, obviously we're gonna collect rigorous data so we can have a, the most finite and specific picture that we have. Um, but at that point, really, there should be a, a, a lot of data that's already been collected to really identify the specifics for what the student has to have. Um, 
And just as a reminder, right, to be eligible for special education services, we're talking about there has to be the presence of a disability, there has to be adverse educational impact, and then the need for specially designed instruction. So once we've gotten through all of tier one and tier two, if the student still hasn't responded to that, um, then we're looking at this again, specific learning disability concept that I've touched on already. So under federal law, specific learning disability is a disorder in one or more basic psychological processes involving the understanding or use of language. So kind of harkening back to one of the questions we had before, it may manifest itself in an imperfect ability to listen, think, speak, read, write, spell, or do mathematical calculations. So it's fairly encompassing. And then we're talking about SLD, really the major areas there were listening comprehension and oral expression, for reading, we have basic reading skills, reading comprehension and reading fluency. And then for mathematics, we have mathematics calculation or mathematics problem solving, and then also written expression. So dyslexia, dysgraphia, and dyscalculia fall in as sort of types of each of those. So a student may be eligible for a specific learning disability, and we recognize that their needs and basic reading skills are consistent with dyslexia. And that's how a lot of our eligibility paperwork works. And when we're doing these evaluations, uh, we are looking at a combination of both the response to interventions as well as our uh, processing and assessment data that we're collecting. So, um, but just to mention again, as Dr. Parandozzi did earlier in the presentation, just having one of these conditions, one of the three Ds, does not necessarily mean you're guaranteed eligibility for special education services for a specific learning disability, right? Some students who have these uh, will qualify for SLD, but we have to meet these other conditions, right? There has to be adverse educational impact um, and the need for specially designed instruction, and that we want to have, you know, attempted other intervention programs to make sure we're getting these kids access to intervention services as early as possible. Um, and also just one last point to, to bring to light here, no single measure is necessary or sufficient to determine SLD. I know there are lots of assessment tools that we like to use and they're very helpful for identifying these conditions, uh, but there is no one. It's always a multidisciplinary evaluation. And then with that, I believe we will return to Ms. Shea. If we could go to the next slide, please. So thank you, Dr. Wheeler. Um, and so Ms. Pastor, we're gonna, I'm really gonna bring it back to you and just thank you for letting um, Dr. Pirandozzi, Dr. Wheeler and I have this time. Um, mm -hmm. And I know we have seven minutes left, so I'll turn it back to you to see what questions we can answer. All right, now thank you. No, I appreciate the work that you've done uh, to put this together. There's so much here. Uh, so I just quickly wanna go back and again, you don't have to answer my question now because I want to deep dive on it. I am concerned about parents knowing about all of these things and how they get to know it and not waiting until there are um, uh, concerns with the learning and going down a very long road before anyone ever gets to this, that it's about information. I also want to take a look at um, the African American population particularly because I, and I'm so happy that at least three times during the presentation it has been said this is not necessarily about special education and that's what very often um, people hear and and it goes very deep and very and way back in terms of the soul of what has happened to to children of color over many, many, many decades, and we need to get rid of it. So I really would like some very definitive answers about how we embrace parents in this and how we know that with the 1400 teachers who've been trained that they go back to their schools and that the schools are embracing it, giving them opportunities to share and that there's follow through and follow up, et cetera. So, all of that is out there. I can, I'll write it up so that we can get the answer. And now for the last few minutes that we have, um, anyone from the committee have a burning question? I mean, just tapping your little feet under your tables that need to be answered today. I do, Ms. Pestier. Yes, ma'am. Well, first of all, I wanted to say, I appreciate all of the information provided. 
But I do have a concern and it's a piggyback of a concern. I think we either discussed in the full board meeting or in this meeting last month that we have these programs, but we don't have widespread deployment of them. And I'm glad to hear that we have more than a thousand teachers trained. Um, and then I think I just saw 374 in letters. But since most of the interventions, if you will, for our children are coming in the general education setting, I am very concerned that we have children with needs who are not being met. And I'm even more concerned because we already expect our teachers to differentiate um, sometimes across four grade levels within the same classroom. And it sounds to me like it's almost impossible for a teacher to meet the needs of, of all kids and especially kids that have these unique challenges. So I don't even know if there's a question in there, but it, there is a concern. Thank you, Ms. Mackin. And, and what I can do um, to help with that and, and I don't know if it will, but I think it might give you additional context. I'll work with my team to also show the breakdown by school, because I will tell you that when we were offering these trainings, we were very intentional about, to your point, um, starting with every reading specialist, starting with at least one representative from every building having Morton Gillingham, starting with four teachers from every building having letters, because we were trying to have that universal access that you described. Um, so what I can do is work to break down that number so we can see that, because I think you raise a really good point, and I know Ms. Pester often talks about this, um, how important it is that we are in partnership with the Department of School Support and Achievement that supervise principals and schools because we can have the best PowerPoint describing programs in the world, but if we're not seeing that transfer in the classroom, it's not going to make the difference. And I also want to offer, and actually the timing is perfect, um, we do meet with um, Sue Han, who helps with Parent University and with our community outreach liaisons. She's actually happens to be coming to my academics team tomorrow for another purpose, but I certainly can connect with her, Ms. Pesture, about your point around how can we leverage all of this great information to help empower our parents, especially if our youngest children, to, to know what the expectations are, what our um, BCPS approach is, and then what their um, avenues are as parents to get the support they need. So it doesn't have to wait. You know, I know Dr. Pirandozzi works really closely with our special education citizens advisory, but to your point, if we're saying that it's not just for special education, we have to broaden the parent groups that we're bringing this to. So I just wanna offer those as two follow-ups I can take from both of your comments um, to help address that. Thank, Thank you very you. much. I appreciate yeah, that. Sure. Mr. Mm -hmm. Mahomza, did you have a, a quick question? Because we're now one minute before our next meeting. Yes. Um, um, my interest in this topic really came from uh, community members and those really, who are more uh, versed in this topic and have uh, worked to advocate for solutions in this. I guess my question uh, comes from conversations with them um, and I believe they were watching this meeting and they were asking uh, apart from um, the accommodations um, what other steps is are, is your office taking um, in I guess uh, creating classes to reteach uh, skills in writing and in, in math. Um, can you talk a bit about that? Um, so I'm going to start. This is Ms. Shea again. Thank you, Mr. Mahamza, for that question. So um, what I will offer um, from my perspective first, and then I'll talk. I know we have 30 seconds each, Ms. Pester. Um, right now, our efforts in both math and writing are really in tier one. And so when I said before about dyslexia really being sort of that model first, where we've been able to get to the point of identifying specific programs, um, our efforts, as you well know, as members of the board for the math curriculum in particular, um, our audit of two years ago really told us that we needed to do a complete overhaul. And we've been really working earnestly in elementary school to provide the Bridges curriculum um, in a multi-year rollout. We've gotten as far as second grade and um, hope for next year to expand into the intermediate grades. Um, so that's my first answer, is that it has to start with really strengthening that tier one while working in partnership with um, our special education folks about what are those additional layers. Um, so that is our work. That's the next step. And I would say for writing, the same is true. Um, 
Dr. Wolf and Ms. Kraft, who will be back again in April as well. Um, we have been focused on the same thing about strengthening our tier one in our writing program. Um, as you also might remember, we're currently right now in the midst of our audit with MSDE. We have not yet, we're awaiting the results and anticipate getting them very soon um, for ELA curriculum to identify our needs. And then our next steps will be about strengthening those resources for tier one. Um, so that's my part in that piece in addressing your question. Um, I don't have the same menu list um, because the first work has to be strengthening that first instruction to provide all of our students with that. Um, Dr. Pirandozzi, I don't know if there's anything that you want to add in our 20 seconds left. Well, <laughs> for, for us, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Shea. And a real uh, 20 seconds, Dr. Perandozzi. Ours is very simple, Ms. Pastor. For us, we follow the accommodations and the needs and services on a student's IEP and all of our accommodations and instructional strategies work towards students with their general education curriculum or their alternative strategies curriculum or specially designed instruction for students on alternative standards. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Hager, I know you had a question, but we do need to move on out of respect for the next meeting. So I'm going to ask all members of the committee um, for anything you get from our, our constituents, uh, our parents, our students, uh, anything we get to first send it out as a question to our staff. And then if necessary, we can add um, and have some discussion at our last meeting. Just let me know in advance so Dr. McComas can make sure we have the time for um, uh, or put on the agenda. That being said, uh, I want to thank all of you again. Bravo. Thank you for doing this. Wonderful. And I need a motion to adjourn, please. So moved, Matt. Thank you, Ms. Matt. Thank you, Mr. Offerman. We are now adjourned and again, very gratefully so. Thank you.